Welcome to Calvary Temple Church here in the heart of downtown Winnipeg. Calvary Temple is people, people of all generations and all nations. Stay tuned for a message of hope and encouragement. Feathers in the Wind. That title is based on an old Jewish proverb about a rabbi, a rabbi who lived in a small town. He was respected by everyone. People honored him. They trusted him. They valued him. They thought he was a wonderful person. They they trusted his words. They trusted his deeds. They trusted his actions. He was very, very, very important to them. Well, a visitor came by the town, and no one knew what he was up to until it was done. He began to spread gossip about the rabbi. He said, this rabbi cannot be trusted. I knew him when, and he began to say things that weren't true. And what happened was there were people that were just insecure enough to believe some of the things that this visitor to the town was saying. He was saying things that were not true, but he was saying them, and slowly but surely, people began to mistrust the rabbi, and they began to doubt his words, and they began to question what he was saying, and he became very, very upset about it. And you know, the rabbi couldn't understand what had happened. Why are people not trusting me? So finally, this man, who was a visitor to the town, decided that he would stay in the town. He moved into the town, and he, he got to know the rabbi. And he figured out that all of the things that he had said about the rabbi were not true. So he went to the rabbi, and he said, Rabbi, I'm very sorry that I said those evil things about you and that I lied about you. I, I don't know how I can make it up to you, but... So the rabbi said, what I'd like you to do is go home. I'd like you to go home and get your pillow off your bed, go out on a windy day, and rip open the pillow and let the feathers fly everywhere. So the man did that, and then he came back to the rabbi, and he said, Rabbi, I've done what you said I should do. What do I do now? He said, well, take the same pillowcase and go out into the field and pick up all the feathers that you have let blow in the wind and put them back in the pillow. As he did as the person asked, he said to the rabbi, I, 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 I can't get the feathers back. That's impossible, he said. I, I just can't do it. And the rabbi said exactly my point. And so today... We're going to talk on the subject of bearing false witness. It's found very clearly in a passage of Scripture in the Bible, often called the Ten Commandments, and it reads this way, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not lie. And here's how God says it through Moses for all of us today because we believe very much that God's Word is eternal, that these are principles, principles of God that apply in an ever-changing world, unchanging principles that apply. It's very straightforward. Don't bear false witness. We live in a world that lives on half-truths and the perversion of truth. We hardly know where to find truth. There was a play that uh, was first done in 1955, and then it became a movie. It was called Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Many of you will remember, I think Burl Ives was one of the actors in the movie. It was about Brick and Big Daddy a father and son. 
And I don't know if you remember the line, but I've learned a new word. It's called mendacity. <laughs> and if you were to look up mendacity, if you were to get Siri to say, what does mendacity mean? I tried it, and I know what she said. Untruthfulness. Untruthfulness. And there's a scene in the movie where the father and son it's all about mendacity, son. It's all about lies and liars. You're an expert at it, the dad says to the son. You're an expert at lies and liars, mendacity. Now, if that's the way we view the world, it's a pretty despairing place. When you think that nobody tells the truth, nothing can be trusted, it's really a picture of our godless world is that really the truth? Is everybody a liar? Does everybody tell lies? Is that the world we live in? Well, as believers, I want to give you a bit of good news today. There is absolute truth. We believe, as Christ followers, that there is truth and that life should never be reduced to lies and deception and truth by half measures. You see, in God's economy, truth is the oxygen of existence. His truth comes into our lives and gives us vitality and courage and faith. How did my mom put it? When you tell the truth, son, you don't have to worry about what you said. It's important to recognize that truth and godliness and following Jesus go hand in hand. Yes, we live in a world permeated with lies and liars, but I want you to listen to Jesus speak to Pontius Pilate. You know this from your background, possibly. Jesus says, actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And here's what Pontius Pilate said back to Jesus. He said, but what is truth? Your truth is different than my truth. My Pontius Pilate truth has a bit of zig and zag to it. No, no. Jesus made it very clear. What I say is truth. See, for Jesus, truth is truth. And when Jesus proclaims truth, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. No one can come to the Father except through me. And in our world of relativity, relativity and half-truths, Let's declare it. Jesus is truth. Thank you, Lord. So, there is truth, and his name is Jesus. He's the ultimate measure and standard of truth. So, Pilate, <laughs> Pontius Pilate, what is truth? He's standing right in front of you, Pontius Pilate. He is the truth. The very reason he came into this world is to seek and save and to bring us the truth. So here's some scriptures that you may not be aware of. Romans 3. If everyone else in the whole city of Winnipeg in Canada in the world is a liar, God is true. Wow, that's comforting. But God is not a man, so he does not lie. He does not lie. Let me set out three real brief principles on truth for a moment. Truth is propositional. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, it means that when I say that, for example, this is blue, well, that means that it cannot be read. When I make a proposal, then the antithesis is false. If something is true, then the opposite is not true. 
It's the law of non-contradiction. Uh, when you say something that is absolute fact, then the opposite is not true. For example, God tells us that God is holy and just. That's either true or not true. He says there's a heaven and a hell. That's either true or it's not true. He tells us that God loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's a proposition. And if that proposition is true, then the opposite is not true. Well, it is true that truth is black and white. But it's more than that. It's also relational. What is truth? Well, truth is a person. Truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. God relates to us through the person of Jesus Christ, through His power of His Holy Spirit. The truth is that there are people who have met Jesus and truth connected with them. Boy, do I ever love meeting someone who's a brand new Christian. You know, you know the kind of person that's, wow, did you know Jesus loves you? They just found out they, I've even met people who knew the prayer, prayer book backwards and forwards. They were raised in a religious tradition, and then they met Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, and their whole life was changed. They went, wow, Jesus is alive. Jesus was real. And, and you know what? They went around hugging everybody and loving people, and, and, and the grass was greener, and the trees were brighter, and everything was wonderful. Why? Because they met truth. And truth set them free. And so we believe in the fact that truth is relational. When people meet Jesus, now, the person who meets Jesus, the second or third day after they meet Jesus, they may not be able to write a theology book. They might know all, they don't know all the doctrines, but they know a person. And that kind of truth relationally sets them free, filled with indescribable love, knowing that Jesus is alive and that he called them and he forgave them and he came into their lives. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, in the middle of that, we live in this shifting world, this uncertainty, this relativism, in a world where so many conflicting philosophies and isms where people say there is no truth. It's all relative. Well, truth is the essence of God's character. God cannot lie. He is the final truth. Now, I know that sitting here, it's pretty safe and pretty easy. God is truth. Oh, that feels good. But what about where you work? What about the person who does not believe in absolute truth? What about the world that has no absolutes, that does whatever they please? We are forced to deal with half-truths and deceit and hypocrisy every day. <laughs> What's that new word? Mendacity. Untruthfulness, lies and liars everywhere. Now listen to how Jesus states this. Now you're not going to like this, but this is Jesus. I'll just, just bear with me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, it is, in, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Wow. If God is truth, there's an opposite. And Jesus said, this is it. The devil is filled with lies. So I want to share two things, I think, that can help here about what Jesus meant. 
First of all, lying is genetic. We're all related to Adam and Eve. Did you know that? We're all born in sin. We're all human beings. <laughs> Have you ever noticed? Those of us who get to care for grandchildren, I mean, it's amazing. Whenever you say, who did it, they always say, he did it. Have you noticed that? And they don't study how to do that. That just comes out of a kid as naturally as can be. In fact, if there's no one else in the room to blame, they say, you did it. <laughs> a seven-year-old saying, you did it. No, no, no. That, that, it's genetic. It's in the human frame. It's so deeply ingrained. And we all carry the same disease, friends. There isn't one of us that doesn't from time to time at least admit you're tempted to shift the blame. I wasn't really there. Amazingly how there's family resemblance in our genetics. Have you noticed that? Yes, we're all related to Adam and Eve, but we also are related to our parents. I saw a picture once of my, grand, of my mother, who is the grandmother to my children, the great-grandmother, and uh, her maiden name was Brubaker. And when I see little Roxy, I say, boy, oh boy, the, the genetics was working strong on that deal right there. In fact, I once in a while, and people will say to me, boy, do you ever remind me of your dad and I say no I don't and they say oh yes you, you can't deny this Bruce the genetics is in you you are like your father once in a while a sibling will say you know when you started to lead that song and when you kicked your leg and when you did this and that I thought of old papa he just did that the same way and I'd like to deny it but the genetics is at work and when it comes to this truth-telling business, we live in a world where we are sinners by birth and we are sinners by choice. And boy, does it ever get after us. This whole temptation to not tell the truth. Adam had an aversion to truth and lying is genetic and it runs in all of us. Wow. You know what else lying does? It's genetic, but it also blocks the truth. We can't hear or fully understand because our human brokenness blocks the truth. In this world of lies and liars, this mendacity, this untruthfulness that's all around us. And Jesus said, for this reason, people don't know what I'm saying. They don't get it. Well, I want to spend the rest of my time on three thoughts. Number one, truth is the foundation of society. It'll interest you to know that the very first application has to do with courts of law. You must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses, if a malicious witness comes forward and accuses someone of a crime, then both the accuser and the accused must appear before the Lord by coming to the priests and judges in office at the time. The judges must investigate the case thoroughly. Aren't you glad the Bible makes sense? That the Judeo-Christian values work? If the accuser has brought false charges against his fellow Israelite, you must impose on the accuser the sentence he intended for the other person. Boy, giving false testimony is a big deal. If in this way you will purge such evil from among you. Well, here's what that says, basically. Chaos is the cost of falsehood. Chaos. The major prophets are always talking about justice. And when there's no justice, there's chaos. And whether you're talking about a two-year-old, or a five-year-old, or a 12-year-old, 
or the chairman of Enron or WorldCom, whenever there is no truth, there's no foundation. Things rattle apart. The story falls apart. There is chaos when there's falsehood. The second truth I want to leave with you today is this. Truth is the foundation of relationships. Don't bear false witness against another person. Tell the truth. Now those of us, just for a moment, if you're married, you know that communication is hard work. Have you ever noticed that? And sometimes what I meant to say isn't what Miriam heard. And do you know what I've learned? That if I'm smart, I will not allow the correction to sound the opposite to what I said originally. Because that really falls apart quickly. When it sounds like you weren't telling the truth in the first place, I want to encourage you that if you're going to have relationships that are meaningful, they will be based on truth. Listen to old James. Now, this isn't fun, but it's in the Bible, so let's see how it goes. People can tame all kinds of animals. Birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's restless and evil. Remember the genetics? We're all related to Adam. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses curses those who have been made in the image of God. This is the ninth commandment. Don't bear false witness. Don't gossip. Don't say things that aren't true. I read a a rabbinic little parable, little saying. It says, slander kills three. The person who says it, the speaker, the listener, and the person it's about. Words that damage. And I often say to people who are involved in a he said, she said, you said, I said, she said business, I say to them, number one, before you speak, is it true? And sometimes we don't know if it's true. And we should not speak things that we don't know to be true. But even if we know it is true, secondly, is it helpful to speak those words in this setting right now? Is it necessary? Will the earth stop spinning if you don't speak those words? Are those words necessary? And the third thing is, if the person you're talking about were sitting in front of you, would you be saying the words at all? And my friends... I'm a follower of Christ. And that, those three tests call me up short often, often, often in my life. I want to encourage you to think about that today. Listen to Paul in Ephesians. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. Sometimes when you're lied about, you're very tempted to fight back. They sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. Listen to this. This is the take-home for all of us today. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. It's not often what you say, but it's how you say it. Not just what you say. Paul said, speak the truth in love. Some people want to be all love and no truth. Some people want to be all truth and no love. Speak the truth in love. Because why? Well, our speech shapes our relationships. They are based on truth. We can be at peace. We can have love and joy. But when there's no truth, then everything falls apart. And the final point today, truth is the foundation of Christian character. Truth is the foundation of Christian character. As Christ followers, we should be the most trustworthy people there are. But that is not always the case. 
I don't know if you remember this story. It happened in 2001, December 14th. The man's name uh, was George O'Leary. And here's how he put it. I got the dream of a lifetime job. He became the head coach of Notre Dame football for five days. There were reporters that began to seek out the truth about him, and he said he played football in college in New Hampshire, and they went to the school, and guess what? He had never even played football. Then he said that he'd had a master's degree from a certain university, and they checked that out, and he dropped out after the second year and never even got a degree. He sat in front of that microphone with his dream job, And he said, due to a selfish and thoughtless act many years ago, I'm personally embarrassed and I resigned my position and his whole world fell apart. Listen to these words. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature, be led by the Spirit, renew your thoughts, put on your new nature. Listen to this. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Conversion is a lifelong process of change. The closer you get to Jesus, the closer you get to truth. The closer you get to truth, the closer you get to Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching the program today. I'd like to take this moment to pray with people who are feeling that drawing to the Lord, that sense of need. Lord, I'm sorry for my past. Please come into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Would you put that in your own words and just simply pray and ask the Lord to come into your life? Sense that godly sorrow, that the Bible word is repentance. Lord, I turn from my past, come into my life. I want to live for you. And pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, can anyone come to Calvary Temple? And the answer is yes. In fact, on our website, you will see our times and the different styles of services, and you pick the one that's right for you, and you come and join us. We'd love to have you. God bless you, and thank you for watching today. Pastor Martin would like to send you a copy of the book he gives to those he prays with at the close of every gathering. This book will help you discover an abundant life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To request your copy of the Abundant Life New Testament, write to us, visit us online, or call us toll-free. Thank you for your faithful support. Please remember, it's your financial partnership that helps us present this program week by week.